Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching Security Scan. I'm Frank Rausen Pereira. India on Monday announced that Australia will join the upcoming Malabar exercise, which effectively means that all the four member countries of the Quad or Quadrilateral Coalition will be participating in the mega drill. The US and Japan are the other countries that participate in the annual exercise, which is likely to take place next month in the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea. India's decision to heed to Australia's request to be part of the mega naval drill comes in the midst of growing strain in ties with China over the border row in eastern Ladakh. In this edition of Security Scan, we will analyze Australia's decision to join the Malabar exercise. Joining me on the program today are Commander Abhijit Singh, retired, head, Maritime Policy Initiative, Observer Research Foundation. Vishnu Prakash, former ambassador, and Vice Admiral Satish Soni, retired, former commander-in-chief, Southern and Eastern Command. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of Security Scan. Admiral, I'd like to begin the program with you first. Let's first try and understand and analyze the importance, significance, and what the Malabar exercise really is. Uh, well, just to give you a historical background about the Malabar exercise, it started in 1992. This was after the uh, breakup of the Soviet Union. As you are aware, before that, we hardly had any uh, meaningful naval cooperation with the U.S. Navy. And after, uh, the breakdown, after the breakdown of the Soviet Union, we started to come closer. In 1992, Malabar in, in May 92, uh, the first Malabar exercise was held and that became the phase, the phase of that, the fledgling Indo-US Navy cooperation at that time. Then we had about three exercises and came 98, uh, we, when we uh, exploded the nuclear, uh, when we carried out the nuclear test. And <clears throat> then uh, the US imposed sanctions and the Malabar exercises were called off. And we started again in the wake of 9-11 uh, attacks in 2001. And ever since then, we've been having this annual exercise. Uh, 2007 was a watershed year because that was the time we first had uh, the beginnings of uh, the green shoots of uh, Quad. And um, uh, an exercise was held in the Bay of Bengal in which uh, all the four Quad navies participated and in addition, uh, the Singapore Navy was also invited. Now that became a little controversial both uh, in internal politics of India and uh, China of course did not take it as well because it was seen as an anti-China uh, grouping. And then uh, political leanings shifted both in Australia and in Japan and in India and the Quad went into hibernation. And after the rejuvenation of Quad, now this is you know, gathered momentum again. In 2008, uh, we had a uh, security cooperation agreement with J Japan, and in the wake of that, you know, we started to include the Japanese uh, self-defense force navy also in the Malabar series of exercise. And whenever the exercise was held in Japanese waters, um, you know, they joined. In 2015, this was formalized because there was not as much opposition either internally or internationally to uh, Japanese inclusion in, the, in this exercise. And there has been always a talk of Australia joining the exercise, but finally this has been formalized. So this is actually a big <coughs> event in, in, uh, in the uh, date line uh, for the Malabar series of exercise. And uh, it is of immense significance because everyone is now um, sort of uh, fed up with, you know, the belligerent uh, attitude of the uh, CCP Navy. And uh, so that is the importance, I think, of the Malabar uh, Navy developing as a coalition to a joint response to the belligerence of the um, uh, CCP Navy. Absolutely. Right. So, uh, Ambassador, let me bring you in now. So, you know, was this bound to happen, you know, considering everything that has happened in the recent past, this was the most logical step, Australia joining in the Malabar exercise because part of Quad as well and going, going forward with it. Absolutely it was. Australia has been for the last three years uh, been 
indicating a strong interest in joining uh, the exercise. Uh, they have been wanting to deepen the relationship. So have we. Uh, there was a bit of uh, hesitation on our part. In fact, both the US and Japan were uh, also of the view that Australia should join. Uh, we were a little hesitant for a couple of reasons. One, uh, in 2007, when the Quad Dialogue had begun and uh, Australia had participated in for the first time, uh, soon thereafter there was a change in government and Mr. Kevin Rudd, who, was, who is a, a, a sinologist, uh, came and he ab abrupt, abruptly pulled Australia out. So, uh, and Australia has very strong relations <coughs> with China. So, there was a little of a bit of a question mark, but I personally feel and I'm very impressed by uh, the present uh, Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Scott Morrison, the way he has uh, responded to China, Chinese bullying, notwithstanding a very strong economic relationship, uh, the uh, uh, strong Chinese diaspora. He has basically shown uh, that Australia will make sure that dignity, security is not compromised. And it was a very good time to bring Australia in. We just signed a, a comprehensive uh, strategic dialogue, uh, comprehensive strategic partnership uh, uh, with Australia. And then, of course, is China. I mean, uh, without Chinese behavior, what it is, without Chinese aggression, without Chinese bullying, uh, I would think that, uh, you know, a, the quad may not have come to, uh, could, could not have come of age. And secondly, Malabar, it would not have become that much easier to bring in Australia. So these are a variety of factors and uh, the world is literally at crossroads. And you find today that the, in Asia, the, uh, the security architecture needs to be looked at anew and looked at very carefully. Absolutely. Abhijit Singh, let me bring you into the picture now. So, you know, uh, China is watching all this very carefully, very closely. Why is China so concerned? Because we've seen the editorials coming out of China clearly miffed with this development. Uh, Frank, I'd say that uh, over the past few years, uh, Malabar has become a sort of a barometer of the uh, proactiveness of India, uh, US and J Japan in the maritime realm is something that uh, the, the Chinese have always noticed. Uh, so even if you go back to the exercises that were held in 2007 in which Australia and Singapore were also a part, we know that the Chinese had vehemently objected to that uh, coming together of, of five navies. We also know for a fact that in 2015 when the Japanese had joined, there were some murmurs in China about what exactly was this coalition up to. And of course now, uh, even though China has reacted in a, in a very sober, sober fashion, uh, the fact of the matter is that they have taken note, note of, the, of the fact that you know, these navies have come together and they have formed what the Chinese believe is a sort of an Asian NATO. So the, the Asian NATO is a term that the Chinese had actually come up with in uh, 2007, their media had come up with this term when they saw that these navies were all exercising together. China's real problem is that uh, this uh, represents an upping of ante in the, uh, in the maritime realm. And the Chinese believe that this is nothing but a, but a containment strategy to hold China back. Now, if, you, if we have to assess the, the maritime quad or the military quad, I would think it, it could be done on three levels. Geopolitically, strategically, and tactically, operationally. I think uh, this is a very good move, geopolitically and strategically, uh, for the simple reason that our ties with uh, all of these three countries, Japan, Australia, and the United States, have been growing over a period of time. And now, after the final, uh, after the last uh, ministerial conference that was held, it's clear that, that we have to do more to, to strengthen our uh, strategic relationship. Uh, strategically, this makes great sense because this is about constructing a favorable balance of power in the region. And that's something the Chinese noticed, that what we are trying to do is trying to shift that balance of power towards, uh, towards the Indian Ocean, towards the, uh, towards the, towards the, the democracies in the, in, in the Indo-Pacific region. But the thing that I would like to state, and this is something that is up for debate, is whether this really makes any tactical sense. 
And I would, I would posit that one of the things the Chinese have been smart with is that they've actually not been very aggressive in the Indian Ocean region. And the reason they've not been aggressive in the Indian Ocean region is because they don't wish to dominate the Indian Ocean in the same way that they wish to dominate the Pacific. And the Chinese have known for a fact that if we get into some sort of a quasi relationship with all of these three navies, form a sort of a counter coalition of sorts, we would project ourselves as the more aggressive side. Uh, and I just think that there is an issue of timing here as to uh, and, and, and essentially the, the, the tactical logic of what we intend to do, because the Chinese are not actually sending their ships and submarines into Indian waters. They are neither challenging the Japanese nor the, nor the Americans or the Indians in the Indian Ocean. And therefore, by forming this coalition, there's a message that goes out to China is that we are linking what's happening on the border with the maritime domain. And we are sending out a real threat to China that we will dominate the maritime domain. We will interfere with Chinese shipping. You know, we will interfere with Chinese naval operations if push comes to shove on the border. And that, I think, is not the sort of the uh, right kind of message to send to China at this moment when we are kind of negotiating a truce with them on the border. So I would say that it's a positive development in the sense that it's good for us in the relationship that we have with all our three partners. But I think tactically, there are questions that it raises over what was the real idea, what was the end game, the operational end game of trying to do this vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the China, the PLAN presence in the Indian Ocean. Right. All right. So taking the discussion forward now, let's talk about another aspect. So Admiral, uh, you know, uh, all these countries, be it Japan, be it Australia, be it the United States, be it India, have been talking about a free and open Indo-Pacific. They have been talking about how there should be far more freedom of movement in the seas. That having been said, do you believe that we are going to see more cooperation and coordination amongst the Quad nations? And do you believe other like-minded nations are going to join in as well and you know participate in some kind of exercises in the months to come? Uh, well, I would say that these are uh, very initial stages and uh, whilst we can be very optimistic about the uh, grouping as a political grouping and uh, secondly as an economic grouping, I think the fact that it will be an equally strong uh, security and a military or a naval grouping, I think, uh, uh, you know, cannot be said for sure at this particular time. Needless to add that it is required. Insofar as India is concerned, uh, you have earlier, earlier seen many commentators uh, saying that India has been holding back. And that uh, holdback has probably been removed uh, on account of what uh, China has done uh, in Ladakh. Uh, so uh, similarly, uh, uh, Australia has come to the fore now and you know uh, is very strident in its approach uh, towards china uh, the same thing cannot be said uh, for the other asean nations uh, indonesia for example only recently has turned down an american request for uh, refueling of a p8 i uh, aircraft um, malaysia vietnam uh, philippines you know they seem to be uh, dithering but at the same time they are very important nations. Quad by itself, uh, you know, just these four nations, you know, if they can persuade the others, and we have seen this, Japan has been persuading uh, Vietnam and the Philippines. So it depends a lot on, I think, uh, you know, in the next few months, how uh, the American election, what are the results, what are the new administration going to say, there are suspicions about whether uh, the U.S. can stand by its allies in the manner that they expect of the U.S. Because there has always been a suspicion, which has in fact happened earlier, that U.S. is not, whether it is the mischief free for the Scarborough Shoal, etc., uh, the opposition which the U.S. could have possibly given to the Chinese actions was uh, somewhat lacking. So in some, I would say that, you know, the military grouping of these quad navies is just a beginning. Uh, there is a lot more to be done. Uh, there have to be partnerships, uh, you know, in the maritime domain. And this is a very important partnership. India has to look at not only quad as a partner, uh, as a partnership, but even in the Indian Ocean, they would need more partnerships 
countries like france are extremely important countries like indonesia are extremely important and if we have to stand up uh, to the chinese uh, bullying i think we need more partners and i would say that the chinese while they may not be very active in the indian ocean region it is just a matter of time you see in naval warfare what is most important is that you must first have surveillance capabilities to be able to actually deploy forces now the chinese have those sur- uh, surveillance capabilities in the south china sea and that is why they have become very active their aircraft are based their rocket forces can carry out attacks no ship can transmit in the south china sea uh, for um you know very much time without being getting detected and actually attacked so their claims of being able to target the carrier battle groups is correct today but the same claim is not as correct in the indian ocean region so first their uh, their aim would be to have adequate satellite coverages and once they are able to uh, maintain a maritime domain awareness Uh, in the indian ocean which is comparable to what they have done in the south china sea i can assure you that their navy would be venturing out in the uh, indian ocean region and mark my words in 2025 to 2030 you would have a uh, first overseas uh, maritime command of the ccp navy being established with headquarters in gwadar it is it is it is something which is staring us in the face and we have to be aware of their moves we cannot wish them away right so these are some really serious concerns that the admiral has flagged off that having been said ambassador you know we have great bilateral ties with all the three other quad nations you you yourself spoke about the summit that india and australia had uh, you know a few weeks ago it was extremely successful we you know the foreign minister also had an extremely successful visit to japan where uh, an agreement was signed on uh, artificial intelligence cyber security and critical information uh, infrastructure so these are very very crucial developments that have taken place let's not forget the 2 plus 2 between india and the united states also is uh, is scheduled to take place soon you know bilaterally the ties are very strong but as a combined unit what is the potential of the quad from a security perspective and from a foreign policy perspective too uh i would like to quote here what a senior state department official said about quad uh in tokyo itself and she said quote and quote when you think of the quad you think of security uh i think the the whole reason the ethro of quad is to provide security let me elaborate when we talk of a free and open indo pacific region when we talk of freedom of navigation when we talk freedom of over flights why are we talking about that if there is no challenge because there is a challenge we are talking about that let let us uh, not keep our eyes closed to the elephant in the room there is a elephant in the room which is posing that challenge and it is not hypothetical uh, the the elephant in the room has already shown what it is capable of in the south china sea while uh, the pres- the president in 2015 when he had gone to the us uh, for a summit uh, with obama said that they were not militarizing south china sea the premier said that and yet we know what has happened to south china sea i completely agree with the admiral that it is not a question of if it's a uh, it's a question of when when it comes to uh, the uh, the chinese coming to the indian ocean region their ultimate objective is to have a, a blue water navy and uh, i recall just last year in january Admiral Lamba had chaired a, uh, con- uh, a meeting of the naval chiefs, and when he had mentioned that in two hundred years of human history, no navy has expanded the way Chinese navy has. Uh, if they have set up military bases in Djibouti, in Gwadar, and uh, under the BRI also, the whole objective is to get um, ports 
it is not just for the love of it they, there is a game plan and they want to create a sinocentric world order or at least a asian order and it is very much a part of that so uh, security cannot be uh, we have to be able to talk about security openly uh, you are absolutely right that we have very good bilateral relations but malabar exercises and other uh, dialogue processes enable us to work together uh, the name of the game is interoperability i am always find it difficult to pronounce this word and uh, you know we are getting into more complex exercises but before before i conclude i do need to mention a, a two brief points one expand it is not the time for expansion of quad at least and by that token uh, of the malabar exercises also save bringing in singapore now and then because the process is still evolving we are still learning to work with each other and deputy secretary of state begun has said it in so many words that this is not the time yet to expand quad that is one secondly it is many people believe that uh, their us is uncertain there is uh, there is a bit of a fatigue that is setting in mm. question is whether uh, the us public will be is ready to endorse uh, an an operation by the us in the indo pacific theater if it uh, if that is required let's say with vis-a-vis -vis taiwan let's so there are uncertainties of the level of us commitment and all these factors have to be weighed in and that is why uh, efforts like malabar exercises squad for india japan and australia because we will continue to be in the indo pacific region sure. and uh, others may come and go but we are there so these this cooperation is very important and we need to build on that because this threat from china this aggression from china is not going to go away absolutely abhijit singh so several concerns raised there by the previous two speakers uh, what's our option really that is one secondly what would we like to achieve through the malabar exercise is it you know subtle messaging or is it something else look i mean i would agree uh, first of all with uh, both the admiral as well as the ambassador that china is certainly a threat it's it's a threat in the pacific it's a threat in the indian ocean region and and yet there are there are certain nuances to china's presence in the indian ocean which is really a theater of concern that are worth highlighting uh, first as i've noted you know the chinese have two separate strategies for the pacific and the indian ocean and the pacific as i said it is full spectrum dominance they rec they recognize that they these waters are china's rim seas and they demand a greater uh, degree of push and a greater degree of dominance in in uh, in in that theater Uh, in the indian ocean i would i would say this that you know uh, shiv shankar menon ambassador shiv shankar menon often says that with china there is often a push factor and a pull factor which means that while the chinese are pushing in the indian ocean region indian ocean states smaller island states are also pulling them pulling china towards them so the chinese if you look at the belt and road initiative that we have not uh, not talked about is very welcome in the region with with a lot of countries talk about maldives talk about sri lanka bangladesh you know thailand myanmar all of these countries are very willing to work with china in the region so what the chinese have actually done is that they've constructed a very smart strategy that combines both military presence as well as a geo economic blueprint and the geo economic blueprint is bri so what they've done is that they've organically created a need for china in the region and look at the missions that they involve themselves in it's anti piracy it's humanitarian assistance and disaster relief it is non combatant evacuations uh it's peacekeeping now uh how do you expect india and the rest of the quad partners to actually push back china or push out china from the indian ocean region when what the chinese are actually seeking to do or at least what they want the world to believe they are seeking to do is to just provide a security good and what they are trying to tell the region is that we are here with our money we are here with our investment please take advantage of of our presence in these waters so mm. i think what our strategy should be to answer your question is not to just look at the quad in terms of security even though i would agree that it is the principal element of this whole construction the whole conception of the quad i think what we've got to do is to look beyond that to also look at issues and we've begun to recognize all of this such as infrastructure building such as connectivity such as technology such as 5g so uh, when an investment so what we are then able to do is to construct this bigger uh, framework 
in which we are able to allow for a full spectrum pushback of China, not just in the military realm, but also right. in the economic realm, also, the, also in the technology realm. That is, I think, the way forward to push out China from the Indian Ocean region, not to just focus on security, but on other uh, other areas that might be equally important as well. Sure. Points taken. Okay. Quick closing comments now from all my guests. I've got about a minute left. So please be brief. Starting first with the ambassador. I saw you uh, putting up your hand. You wanted to say something. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, on BRI, let me say that there is a veneer of uh, of offering economic uh, economic assistance or developmental assistance. That veneer is we wearing thin. Even in South Asia, country after country, Maldives, etc., are realizing what they have gotten into. Right. So I'm not saying that uh, it is uh, BRI is not bringing in funds, but it is coming with strings attached, and there is an ulterior motive. Sure. Now, Admiral. Uh, okay, you want me to stop? Sure. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador. Well, uh, Admiral. Yeah. You know, I would like to say that in the wake of what has happened in the north, we should not lose focus on the maritime domain. That is where our long-term interest lies. The Indian Navy has not been receiving the kind of budgeting that it budgetary support and we need to enhance that support on an urgent basis so that there are no uh, gaps, capability gaps which emerge. And secondly, I would like to say that IORA and IONS have a very important role to play to get these nations together to concentrate on non-traditional challenges like IUU, HADR. Sure. Uh, you know, etc. I mean, this is what is bothering the smaller countries and India must be in the forefront to solve these problems. Only then we can keep the extra regional uh, powers away. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, Abhijit Singh, close the show for us with a quick I, concluding remark. I'd only really like to make one comment, which is that the real uh, challenge to India from China in the Indian Ocean is actually Chinese submarines. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these submarines are floating around in South Asia and we need to no do something to deter these Chinese operations. So I think sure. what we need to focus is on underwater deterrence capability. We've got to get sonars, we've got to get sonoboys, we need a whole set of underwater sensors mm -hmm. to be able to detect these uh, Chinese submarines. So we need, we need to go beyond basically aerial surveillance of China, which is what we are focusing on right now, and right. get the Quad also to build our capability not just focus on uh, the rules-based order, implementing a favorable rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific, but mm. specifically look at the Andaman Sea and how the Quad can help us in having better control, a better sort of a dominance o over the space. And that is, I think, the way forward for, uh, for the Quad and also for the Malabar. All right. Points taken. On that note, I'll call it a wrap on this edition of Security Scan. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program. That's it from me. See you again next time.